Herkese merhabalar. Sabancı DX'in ilk YouTube e, kanalının açılış videosunu çekiyoruz. Bugün ünlü bir konuğumuz var. Osama Payet. Dünyada tanımlanan ilk CDO olarak geçiyor kendisi. Bugün e, yapay zeka üzerine ve yapay zekanın iş dünyasında etkileri üzerine konuşuyor olacağız. Welcome Thank you. Uh, Mr. Payet. Um, I would like to just talk about the AI and the business impact of AI. Uh, but let's start with a popular question. Uh, how the AI will impact uh, the employment uh, or unemployment? Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, hype you hear nowadays about uh, AI replacing jobs and making us all brainless, jobless, etc. Um, if we judge by the past history of AI, and we have had now uh, three waves of AI, right, starting with the 50s in the first wave, 80s in the second wave, both waves followed by big winters because there was a lot of hype, a lot of exaggeration in terms of the impact, what it would do. Uh, twice it kind of failed after spending a lot of money. Uh, but what happened in each case is we end up generating much more jobs than there were before in the, the areas addressed by AI. Um, what happens is a good pattern in my opinion. Uh, it actually elevates the level of interaction where you let the machine do a lot of the work that a machine should do uh, and you use the human for the kinds of things that we cannot get machines to do well which is decision making, common sense reasoning, uh, knowing kind of what to do under new situations, under exceptional situations, all of that. And there's a high value there. Uh, the general, the general uh, analogy I use is like uh, accounting. If you go 50 years back, you know, accounting was, you know, you open these huge ledgers and you have to have good handwriting and good addition skills. None of those are relevant today. We have a lot more accountants than we ever had before. And what they do is much, much higher value than adding numbers and recording numbers. So I think a similar phenomenon happens here is when you actually can do things in a more scalable way, in a more automated way, and you, you take I often use this quote that was used uh, by, uh, it was coined by others, but it says, AI is not about replacing the human with a robot. Mm -hmm. AI is about taking the robot out of the human, mm -hmm. which I think That's really is, uh, yeah. is, a, is a good uh, kind of, it captures well yeah. how I think about it. Definitely. Now, many very famous people are kind of painting very dark scenarios and AI will take over. And yeah, look, a lot of Technology, especially when you weaponize it, you know, I mean, you know, a, a drone driven by AI with, with weapons and with missiles can be an extremely dangerous thing, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, an, an, an airplane flying, relying on certain sensors that fail, like what happened with Boeing 737, uh, you know, very bad things can happen. Uh, so we need to be very careful about kind of how we use the technology and how much we trust the technology. Uh, versus be worried about the technology itself. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, the, the second question is about the AI and the business impact. There's a lot of articles about what business life should expect from AI. And uh, right now, I, I think there's a hype. The hype is a little bit inflated, and we, we really should um, put AI in the right place without inflating the, the expectation. Yes. How, how do you define it? I mean, what should business life expect? I mean, isn't it magic? <laughs> well, first of all, there, there is definitely no magic. Uh, the second part is, it's not a little bit inflated. It is a lot inflated, right? Which is funny because this is exactly what happened in the 50s and 60s. This is exactly what happened in the 80s. And I actually think we will hit another AI winter where many people, because of the lots of the inflation of expectations, there will be disappointments, right? Uh, I will tell you the following. Some of the very basic, basic problems we've had in AI from the very beginning, from defining what intelligence is, to natural language processing, to machine vision, to a lot of the fundamental AI problems, planning, we haven't really advanced much. Uh, one of the patterns that I see consistently, and one of the areas of AI that has survived both AI winters, and probably will survive the third, is machine learning. Mm -hmm. And it survived it, and this is a, a quote due to uh, Peter Norvig at Google that I like a lot. 
he said it 10 years ago, I think it's still very true. Uh, it's not because we have better algorithms for AI or machine learning, it's because we have a lot more data. Mm -hmm. So the way I would say it, and uh, today I'll, I'll be talking about kind of my five lessons learned in making AI work at the enterprise. Uh, there are certain ways you can choose to make AI work very, very well, right? And usually these are summarized in the problem you solve has to be extremely narrow. Uh, so as, as an example, and, and, and you make it so narrow that you know everything uh, about the world in that problem. So for example, chess playing or checkers playing, if you, if you know what's on the board, you know everything. Mm -hmm. A lot of business tasks can be cast that way. A lot of uh, engineering tasks can be cast that way. If you do that, then your algorithm can be very intelligent in that very, very narrow domain, and it can do a lot of things. It can do magic. Magic in the sense that it can learn to be better than humans in that very narrow area. But the minute you ask it something outside that narrow area, it's actually uh, uh, you know, idiotic. It knows nothing about it. But that is a way to make it successful, right? You, you pick these very narrow verticals and you solve them very precisely. Uh, you make sure you can leverage the data because it's all about the data. Most AI problems are too hard to solve and the way we solve them is by going to the data and doing machine learning to replace NLP or machine vision or any of these things that we don't know how to do yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the question then is you ask, you know, I ask many companies, so what's your story for data? Are you managing the right data? Are you capturing the unstructured data, which is very valuable? Do you have means of analyzing it, extracting intent and meaning out of it? Uh, and that's where many companies kind of fail. I think where the impact is happening is it's, it's very dramatic, right? So in, in areas like, uh, I'll take, you know, just as an example, drug discovery, where you know, robots can try combinations of drugs. The AI actually can do a lot of interesting things, a lot, a lot of it driven by data, so they will ingest every article, everything published, everything written about interactions of chemicals. And that will help them reduce the amount of search and combinations and predict which combinations are likely to succeed. So a lot of drug discovery today is driven by AI algorithms. Um, X-ray reading. Um, in the US, almost all X-rays are actually read by machines now, no longer humans. And the human kind of checks it very quickly and verifies and then comes up with a diagnosis or the decision or an interpretation, which is actually where humans do really well, right? You're, mm -hmm. We're not very good at staring at all these x-rays because you get tired, you have bad days, you miss stuff. Algorithms are very systematic that way once you tell them what to look for. Um, the biggest example I would say for impact, I mean impact that touches probably everybody on the planet, is search. Sorry. AI today, is search today, Google or Microsoft or Yahoo, whoever. Search today is completely dependent on machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, it is based on extracting a whole bunch of features to describe a document, thousands of features, and then they pick about 500 of them, and they, the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm, tunes uh, the importance of those features so that the top, uh, uh, top articles, the top matches, come to the, to the top of the matching list. When you type 2.8 keywords in in the average Google search, the, the matches are in the billions of documents. Yet, the top 10 or 20 probably contain the result you're looking for. Now that feels like magic, right? Yeah. Uh, and it is amazing. And it does something that no human can ever do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it does it super fast and well, but no human can also explain how it's done because it's actually done by a machine learning algorithm that actually is optimized over a lot of training data uh, many, many, many projects in AI are actually dependent on training data and, and the most expensive part is getting that training data. Whether you're trying to do autonomous driving, where you take videos of the car driving around and then you have people interpreting them and saying, you know, this is the road, this is a person, this is a cat, this is a balloon, this is a... And that's, that's how kind of learning happens. Highly dependent on training. Uh, search is no different. We, you know, Google hired tens of thousands of people to do editorial labeling of the data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then saying the search result is good, this is bad, move this one below, move this one above. Yes. So, 
so it can have huge impacts, and it does have huge impacts on us today. In manufacturing, the impacts are probably the most, uh, the most dramatic because uh, you can achieve much automation. Again, in manufacturing, there are many tasks that are better done by a machine, and we know this, than a human. And often when the human is doing it, it's not a good thing. But when you actually make it more efficient and more systematic and more scalable, you can actually end up creating many, many more jobs for, for humans to be doing higher value things on top, yeah. using these things, etc. Yeah, the third question should be uh, around the employment, around the AI. We have a very young population, nearly half of the population is younger than the, the 35 years old. And right now, the, the Minister of National Education is discussing how we should I mean, invest in the, the, the new uh, capabilities. Uh, and the, the young professionals is trying to shift the, the track into the, the new world, I would say. What, what, what can you recommend to Turkey or the Turkish companies? I mean, how we can, we can develop the capabilities? Where should we invest? Yeah, I think, I think for... I mean, I think with this, with this new revolution and these new fields, whether it's AI, data science, cybersecurity, any of these areas that require kind of intelligent information processing and understanding, uh, my advice is the following. There are no serious leaders. Uh, any company can become a huge company in this space. It's only a question of finding the talent and finding the focus, right? Which is why, for example, the U.S. is very worried about China these days, right? Uh, in the last uh, AI hype wave uh, in the 80s, they were very worried about the Japanese fifth generation systems, which never amounted to anything. Uh, but to me, uh, this is, is kind of a great equalizer, because if you actually have a certain critical mass of people focused on a problem, especially in a practical uh, setting where you are solving a real problem with real constraints and you're not doing pure theory You can actually create something that is extremely valuable to the rest of the world mm -hmm. And I think that's the real opportunity here is anybody with a little bit of the know-how and an ability to kind of focus and Do some interesting work some innovative work can probably create the next Google or the next you know, Skype which was created really out of Estonia or the next you know, what have you. So we are in that, in that stage where nobody really knows what, what they're doing in AI. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation. Some of it becomes very valuable, a lot of it is not. Uh, and any country and any small group of people can actually have a huge, huge impact if they just focus on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other question is around the, the uh, AI projects or programs in, in, in the companies. Uh, you lately uh, work for Backblaze and uh, you advise many, many projects, many companies. And not every AI or advanced analytics program is successful. There are lots of traps. Uh, what are the main traps and why do the AI projects fail? Fail yeah. to implement. Them? Oh, great. So first of all, the, the biggest reason for failure is people, people expect too much and the expectations are unrealistic. But even if you take it away from that and you say, okay, let's look at realistic problems. Uh, the biggest trap for failure is people don't think through uh, what is the underlying data story. How do I get the right data, the right training data? The training data is the most valuable asset in any AI project because like we said, most AI algorithms are not practical. We cannot make them work, so we have to use machine learning to help us solve them. And machine learning is completely dependent on data. And the sad story in many companies is they would like to do AI, but they don't do data. In fact, one of the patterns I see with the digital transformation work in many companies is they focus on the digitization, they focus on digitizing processes and workflows, they forget about data. And then they come back and say, well, now we don't even understand what this digital transformation is doing. Oh, we forgot to instrument correctly, we forgot to collect the data correctly, we forgot to model it correctly to use it. So to me, if you want your digital transformation to be intelligent, then you must think about the data from day one, and you must think about how you design it so that you can actually get that data, because that data is essential to make any AI work. Now, 
when you have the data, this is the counter side of it, your chances of making almost any AI work is very high if you have the right talent and the right people. So the second huge trap I see is many groups inside a company would like to do AI because they're intrigued, they want to do it, but they don't know enough. So the lack of talent is also another problem. Mm -hmm. And many companies reach a conclusion, well, this technology doesn't work for us or we couldn't get it to work. Well, that's, that's not the right conclusion if you didn't try it the right way. Uh, so it's very, very important. Uh, for example, at Barclays, uh, I insisted on bringing small firms out of Silicon Valley to work with my teams there to make sure to teach them how to do stuff, how to do big data, how to do machine learning, uh, how to deploy AI. And then when the teams learn through working with, with these small companies, they can now create their own projects and do things and create their own talent pool which can start doing magic in, in the organization. Uh, since leaving Barclays, I went back to my company, Open Insights, and we've been working with some of the world's largest banks, some of the world's largest telcos, uh, uh, some of the world's largest retailers. And in all cases, uh, our secret to making things work is we identify the very narrow application where we know the algorithms stand a chance of success and then making sure the data is fed properly so that we can actually solve those problems mm -hmm. with, with the data. Great, thank you. One last but not least question is about ethics around AI. Uh, you, you know this famous trolley or uh, programming autonomous vehicles uh, problem. I mean, how should we program uh, the, the, the CPU and what is the, f the, the philosophy around it? I mean, what, how, how should we set the ethics around it? I mean, if the, should we program it to hit the wall, hit the five uh, people or hit the kneeboard or hit, hit the elderly people. I mean, how we are going to program uh, the, the, the AI around CPU in the autonomous cars? So. Yeah. I mean, that, that question... It's a long story about that. Yeah, yeah. No, but that question, I mean, it's a serious question, but it has... There is no easy answer to it. Because to me, that is not fundamentally a technology question. Ethic, that's an ethics and a policy and a, and a law question. Um, now, you know, you can ask the same question of a disk drive, right? Mm -hmm. Should I allow this disk drive to store bad pictures or bad recordings or, you know, bad things about people? Uh, you know, I used to always say uh, one of the most dangerous weapons in the hands of society, in, used ma massively by everyone, is the automobile, right? You get two tons of metal that you can actually drive on a sidewalk or hit people with or whatever. But we govern it, we put laws around it, we require certain knowledge before you actually operate it. And we have systems to enforce it when you break these traffic laws and, and so forth. Uh, and that's how we will get around some of these issues of you know, the ethics of these machines you know, getting, doing more and more decisions. How do, we, how do we guide it? How do we control it, etc.? I think that is wide open. I mean, it's exactly, I think, the same issues we have in human governance. You know, how do we put rules to prevent somebody from killing somebody? And yeah. How do we say what decision is better than another? Uh, I think it comes with experience and it comes with rules and laws and norms in society. It has very little to do with AI or any other field, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of the DNA uh, uh, community here for uh, Sabanji Group. And it's a pleasure to be here and, and talking to the folks working about data analytics and AI. Thanks for joining. I appreciate that. Böylelikle e, Sabancı'da YouTube kanalının ilk programını tamamlamış olduk. Bizleri izlediğiniz için teşekkürler.